All right, since I have entirely too much to say and too little time to do it, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is digi uh, Best Digital Tools for Writers Workshop, and I'm honored by the fact that you all have decided to get up at this time on the last day of the conference and fill this room. It's really exciting. Um, and then I have this brief introduction. Howdy, y'all. I'm Waka, spokes puppet for Patui, puppet journalist, and here to introduce Dr. Sam Patterson, talking about best digital tools for writer's workshop. We're excited to see you all here today. What a great looking room. And here, without further ado, Sab Patterson. Yay! Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I am Sam Patterson. I have been teaching English for, I think it's something like 11 years. Hi. Um, and I've done that in grades 7 through 12. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a lot about my experiences trying to get Writer's Workshop to work. Quick show of hands, how many people teach in this room teach English and have worked with Writer's Workshop? Okay, great. So, some of what I'll say will just validate your own frustrations. Um, and by and large, I hope that this really serves to, with some of us, it's going to be a continuing conversation because I recognize some of you from Twitter. Um, and with others of us, I hope that it's the beginning of a great ongoing conversation about Writer's Workshop. Uh, what are the goals of Writer's Workshop? They're, it's really to turn students into writers. Uh, we do this by having students work like writers do by trying on the skills and habits of writers. They, in order to do this, you know, they really work at developing a sense of audience. Writers know their audience, and they know their responsibility to their audience. Uh, writers also have skills with collaboration. Even though writing can sometimes be described as a lonely pursuit, Writers don't work alone. They work with other people. And that gets tricky because there's a lot of ego wrapped up in writing. If you play a game about the number of times I mention affect and ego talking about writing, you'll get to a pretty high number, I think, because I keep coming back to it. And when we think about the ways that we interact with students around writing, that's something that I think we can't be reminded of too often is that when they share their writing with us, they're really putting themselves out there. They're really taking a risk. And we have to do what we can to make that easier for them. Um, and writers have a sense of voice. And honestly, the term voice used to drive me crazy because I'd hear teachers say, find your voice, like it was a set of keys that had been lost somewhere. And I was just like, bah, what do you mean? But <laughs> At this point, I really understand that, that ha is, it's a two-part thing. And part of it is a sense of style, knowing what kind of writing they do well and what of their writing sounds good. But another big part of it is a sense of story. And students get a sense of what it is that they have to say and what it is that they have to share and how they can do that. So, and it wasn't until I was putting this presentation together that I went, Oh, yeah, that's what voice is. Yeah, I got it. Um, because I spent a lot of time in writing classes frustrated. That's part of why I became a writing teacher. Students get a sense of audience. At the beginning of the presentation, I'm going to talk about some of the traditional tools that we've used, and then I'm going to get on, get on to digital tools. Um, Students get a sense of audience in writer's workshop by reading their work out loud to their classmates in a completely conventional writer's workshop. And 
the, then their classmates share their responses out loud. This is true face-to-face, one-to-one, accountable talk, and at the center of it are those words the students have authored. Uh, when a piece of writing works, the audience feels it, and the writers know that it landed. There's something that happens in the room, and that's amazing, and that's one of the reasons that I keep writer, no matter, the, no matter all of the challenges that I will probably say too much about later. If you haven't tried Writer's Workshop yet, don't let me turn you off of it. It's totally worth it. Because we do stuff that doesn't quite work all the time. And Writer's Workshop, when it does, is amazing. Um, having students share their writing like this helps them develop a sense of audience because they see the effect their writing has. They share it, suddenly there's a knowing that happens with the audience, and that's power. With my high school students, sometimes I end up taking this out loud sharing and converting it to a peer response protocol where they write something, the audience writes something, the, reader ha the writer has to compare the two responses. I don't think it has as much emotional impact, but it does take a lot less time. Time's the other thing I talk a lot about. There's e the ego and taking care of students, and then there's time. And I try not to pit these two against each other, but it's really, really hard not to, because time seems to be against absolutely everything in Writer's Workshop, <laughs> especially me. Collaboration. Um, Writer's Workshop is probably one of the first class styles I participated in where there was any sort of true collaboration. Everything else was a situation where I was bringing my work in, I was handing it to the teacher, the teacher was doing something with it, the teacher was handing it back to me. Uh, Writer's Workshop was the first time that I needed to bring copies for everybody in the room, and then we handed it out to everyone, and then everyone eventually handed them all back to me. Um, so that collaboration was really powerful. If we look at it from a workflow model, though, there's a big problem with that, because all of the collaboration happens on this piece of paper, and the piece of paper is either with me, or it's with the person responding to me, or it's with the teacher. And it can't be in more than one place at a time, which is really frustrating when you get back to that issue of time, because every time that paper needs to go from me to one of my collaborators, we have to meet. So that's a class period. So class period one, I give the paper to the collaborator. Class period two, the collaborator maybe gives the paper to the teacher so the teacher can verify that the work's been done. Class period three, the teacher gives the work back to me. That's assuming that between class period two and three, the teacher was able to get through all those papers. Poor teacher. Um, so a lot of what ends up being the focus of making Writer's Workshop work, whether it's paper-based or digital-based, is this issue of workflow. And I think what I'm always after when I'm looking at tech integration in a writing classroom is figuring out a workflow that is as invisible as possible. So we shape our style based on what we need to say and the needs of our audience. One piece of positive feedback on the writing we do can completely shape the writing choices we make from that point on. When I have somebody respond to the writing I do and say, wow, that's really good, then I know what I need to do is I need to make that choice, whatever that was, more often. When I teach writing, I've been lucky enough to teach in private Jewish schools for my whole career. And this has given me an amazing environment with small class sizes and hundreds of reasons for public English teachers to hate me. Um, <laughs> seriously, just want to put that out there. It's okay. Um, but what I've tried to do is really take the work that I'm doing and make it as public as possible so that the stuff that I try and mess up on you don't have to bother with. Um, but one of the neat things about teaching in that environment is there's, it's values rich and there's a lot of discussion about values. And one of my favorite phrases has been from strength to strength. And I see this 
in writing instruction like nothing else. I can remember as a sophomore in college writing a paper for my Shakespeare class and using commas like 30 different ways, having no clue what I was doing, but conscientiously using them 30 different ways. Well, maybe this will work, and maybe this will work. Um, the teacher was smart enough not to mark all of my errors and tell me I was wrong. She said, I quit here. This is the page you need to read in the style guide. <laughs> and then I had, but what, what changed everything was then I had a conversation with her about commas and how to do that. I still make a lot of errors, but I was able to, after that conversation, tell when I was making some of the right choices. So if when we're responding to our students and we're teaching them to respond to each other, we have them focus on what's working well, that allows students to make, make choices in that direction as they go forward. Um, so getting back to traditional tools, um, it's easier to repeat good decisions than it is to avoid bad ones. Traditional writing workshop is really great at helping students shape their voice because the audience has an emotional response right there with the writer. It's, an, it's immediate affective feedback. And that's a very powerful reinforcement. So when they see that something worked, they're, they're like, wow, that worked. Even if it's not a specific, this sentence is really powerful, they know that that writing works. So they're going to do more of that type of writing. It's really funny. All of the other slides have like this many notes for them. And this is the only one that the scroll bar pops up on. <laughs> Writer's workshop. Um, I asked you earlier how, so it's not news to you that one of the big challenges to writer's workshop is the time involved. Uh, in a typical writer's workshop model, you're having students share out what they're writing. Other students are listening to that. They're responding to it. They're providing feedback. And that's, even if you have them sharing out very short pieces, that five minute share with another five minutes of feedback and a couple of minutes of transition time on each end of it. If you've got a class of 25 and your goal is to have everybody share, suddenly you're looking at some sort of scheme that spans half the year. <laughs> and you know, those numbers multiply quickly. If you, if you ever want to have a lot of fun, start talking to a math teacher about the amount of time you spend responding to one paper and then casually drop in how many students you work with and you'll see the gears start running. They're like, wait a minute, so you've got 100 students and you're spending five minutes per paper that divided, oh my God, that's why I'm a math teacher. <laughs> so, you know, there's that out of class time and then there's the in class time. Um, we really have to believe in this if we're willing to give it this much time. I mean, if it's not something that you're fundamentally like, wow, that can totally change the way everything works for a student, you would never give this much time to this kind of pursuit in a class, especially considering all of the different pressures that are on teachers for performance assessments and reading assessments and all of this stuff. If you didn't believe that Writer's Workshop was a game changer, you would never give it this much time. And I keep saying give because you end up giving a lot of your time to this. I mean, if you start thinking, well, it's my job and that's what I'm paid for. It couldn't possibly be your job because there are laws against jobs that take this much time. So, you know, you are totally giving your time to this pursuit. And when we give something this much time, we really want to make sure that we get it right. So as I've been teaching English, I keep coming back to the challenges of this. And I know that when my students' writing changes, it's often because I've had a face-to-face -face conversation with them about their writing. They've been sitting here, I've been sitting here, their writing is sitting here, and we talk about it, and I ask them questions about it, and they respond to it, and Sometimes there's a light that goes off where they go, oh, 
Sometimes they sit there like, oh my goodness, when will this be over? And I'm reminded of that scene in Holden Caulfield where the history teacher reads him the paper that he wrote. But sometimes a light goes off and the student understands what they're doing more. They understand, they understand the decisions they've made more and it's amazing. But even in my context, which has been just almost built for this with totally reasonable class sizes, a lot of time built into the school day to meet with students, and an obligation that the students understand that they have to meet with their instructors, it's still very difficult to find enough time to have enough of these conversations. So as I've looked at integrating tech into the work I do as an English teacher, a lot of it has been around how do I figure out how to make either more time available to have these conversations or take important parts of these conversations and make them available in a different context. So I'm a very picky teacher. Um, and I'm very protective. And what I'm picky and protective about is the way that I run my classes. Um, I'm incredibly easygoing with the students, but as soon as somebody wants me to do something that I don't completely believe in in my classes, I get really obnoxious. Either that or I go in the room and close the door and do what I will. Because um, those are kind of our two go-to strategies, right? <laughs> we either fight them directly or we're like, uh-huh, 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 see you later. Um, it was, I was trying to figure out the math last night. I think it was 1990 at Warren High School in Gurney, Illinois. Anybody from Illinois? Northwest suburbs here? Woo, Illinois. Um, and I was sitting in a class I didn't want to be in. It was an elective, and it was called Publications. And I was in this class because my high school had done this obnoxious thing where they had taken photography and they had bundled it with yearbook, newspaper and creative writing. I was an incredibly strong math student and I had horrible handwriting. I still have in some ways completely horrible handwriting. In fact, the fact that I've hand drawn these slides is kind of my own act of defiance and courage, right? Yes, I figured this out. Um, but our assignment in this creative writing class with Miss Johnson, do you know her? She's great. Um, was we had a paint chip, we had to cut out a shape on the paint chip, we had to write a poem about the paint chip. I think the instructions were about that complex. And, and you had to use some glue and attach the paint chip shape to the poem. So she's handing back the work and she's like, Sam, why haven't you submitted your stuff to the Creative Writing Magazine? This is great. And I was just like, Miss Johnson, that is my stuff. And at that moment, the way that I saw writing changed fundamentally because I get all choked up. Um, <clears throat> we'll drink water and pretend I'm not having an emotional reaction. Oh, it totally works. So at that moment, someone had responded to the content of what I was saying for the first time. This was junior year high school. No, sophomore, sorry. Totally different. Um, so somebody had responded to the content of what I'd written for the first time instead of, Sam, your handwriting is really messy. I'm like, I know. I mean, I look at the kids I work with today and some of the recommendations they come in with. I'm like, eight out of ten, I would have been labeled as graphic or something early on, right? There would have been some sort of intervention. I probably would have seen some sort of occupational therapist and things would have been at least slightly different. But at that moment, my worldview changed. I ended up getting uh, MFA in creative writing. I was going to go to like school for engineering because I got good scores in math. I try not to think about the pay scale difference sometimes, right? <laughs> but I love what I'm doing and that makes a lot of difference to me. Um, so that is something that's really important to me. I went on after that MFA and, or actually I think it was in the midst of that MFA, I found the National Writing Project, which, anybody National Writing Project in the room? 
It's awesome, and they can tell you it too. Um, totally amazing network of teachers who believe that teachers who write make better teachers of writing. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I started working with them because, honestly, I was a grad student teaching poetry classes, and I was expected to respond to student writing, and it totally stressed me out because I didn't know what I was doing. And then I sat in this room all summer with these teachers who were much more experienced than I was. And on the first day, I honestly thought, oh my goodness, some of these teachers are in kindergarten. What could they possibly teach me who's teaching grad school, you know, who's teaching undergrad students about writing? And by day three, I'm like, these are the smartest people I've ever known. <laughs> and that experience inspired me to go on and get a doctorate in literacy education where for that, I literally studied how a le the lear informal learning environment impacted writing instruction. To translate that a little bit, I got a doctorate in summer camp for writers. <laughs> and what I found in the study I did was that environment is everything. Students need to feel safe to take the risks necessary to be a writer. And that when we ask students to do these things, we need to make sure that they have the support in their environment to feel comfortable taking these risks. So those ideas are what I would call the basis of that pedagogy that's at the center of everything I do with writing. And when I started to do my tech integration work, I, which was only about 16 months ago, I said, OK, everything has to serve this. It has to serve this essential experience I had. And it has to make that accessible to my students. It has to make me more able to share that with my students. So I, I assess these tools. And I'm going to be talking about the tools today. Uh, you know, by how well they help with communication, how well they ease the process and workflow, if they support students getting a sense of audience, and how well they support student voice. Getting students to write in any medium can be challenging. But when the medium itself interferes with students' fluency, it's incredibly frustrating. Whether it's my student, Ben, who's dyslexic and dysgraphic, and I ask him to write things out, and he just gets stuck. Or if it's my students who are working with any number of word processors, and they get to a point where they can't figure out what to do. Or when they're working with a word processor with too many options, and they spend all their time on font selection. Um, you know, all of these are ways where the platform essentially interrupts fluency. And I have a dream that <laughs> at some point there will be a platform that is completely invisible and doesn't interrupt fluency for all of my students. And I've tried a bunch of stuff and I haven't found it yet. But I'm going to share some of what I tried with you. Some of the main tools I've really worked hard at figuring out how to use well, uh, Livescribe, Evernote, and Google Docs. Livescribe, is there anyone here not familiar with Livescribe? Cool. Livescribe is a pen. And it is a um, digital recording pen. I've got another slide on it here. Um, OK, getting a little bit ahead of my auction. So it's a pen that has a infrared camera embedded in the body of the pen. And it will create what the students have written digitally. So they have a special notebook, which yes. So they have a notebook, which looks pretty much like any other notebook. But I wonder if I can get in close enough there. OK. The grain that you see in that picture is not 
noise from the camera, because this is actually an incredible camera from IPVO, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It's a micro dot map of, that's embedded in the paper. So the infrared camera on the pen records the exact position of this map and uploads that. Uh, with this one, it uploads it to Evernote. So you can actually have a digital notebook that is searchable. Like, it will search their handwritten text. It's not OCR, optical character recognition, because it does not convert it to type. It is text. At the same time, it will record the audio that's going on in the room. So as a teacher who's been working towards flipped class instruction and doing class capture and lesson capture, the LiveScribe pen has been amazing because there have been times where I can just hit record and put this notebook underneath my document camera and essentially teach the lesson out of the notebook. And it should autofocus here in a second. Let me. There we go. Uh, it, I can essentially teach the lesson out of the notebook and write what I'm doing, and it records. And then I can send a link to that or attach it to the LMS, and that goes out to the students. So especially when I'm teaching them something like how I want them to put the, the evidence-based paragraph together in their Odyssey paper, and honestly, I'm recording it for the students. Yeah, mom and dad are going to help them do this writing. And if I don't make this lesson incredibly clear for mom and dad, mom and dad are going to help them do the writing wrong. Because God bless them, the parents at my school are smart and helpful, but everybody works off of whatever model they were taught. And I generally have a pretty particular way I want the students to put the stuff together. So I want to package that and I want to send that lesson out to them. And if I'm not doing something like a complete screen capture, this lesson capture works very well because I can just write what I'm doing and it's pretty easy to send it out. Yes? Um, he, he asked, so he's not quite getting it. He captures it and does what with it? So. If you can see this, it, this is uh, my Evernote account. And the pen exports what I'm doing to Evernote um, and captures the page. So let's see if I can get this to be a little bigger. Um, and see, here's where we come against the double-edged sword of this tool. Because sometimes it just doesn't load the web version. So let's see if I can. Nope, it's not going to let me zoom that. Um, there we go. So now you can see what I was talking about with my horrible handwriting. Because if I'm not using a fountain pen tip on some sort of program, this is exactly what it looks like. This pen works just fine, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> my handwriting's that bad. Um, <laughs> but the. So I've written this on a piece of paper, and it automatically uploads it. What is in green tells you that there is an audio recording that's linked to that. So if I was using this for a lesson, and I'm having trouble getting the audio playback version to load here today, um, but if I was using this for a lesson and I had bullet points that were step one, step two, step three, and I, I wrote, I, you would generally write those out ahead of time, and then when I got to that point, I would circle step one, step two, and step three. And then later on when the teacher or when the parent wanted to, or the student wanted to hear what we were doing, they could just click on that and it would play the audio from that section. So the writing that you're doing ends up being a visual index for the audio. So this was designed generally for like if you were sitting in a lecture and you were taking notes in the lecture, you could click that part and you could hear the lecture at the point that you were taking notes. So you know you go back and listen to the part of the lecture you didn't necessarily capture all of. Does that clarify? Is this an actual pen? It is an actual pen. It's a little bit. It, it's you know about this big. I've, I've got it at the back of the room recording. Otherwise, I'd show it to you exactly. But it's a little bit fatter than a regular pen. 
um, but it has essentially a complete computer embedded in it. Yes? It is a special notebook and paper. Um, and the way that the notebook and paper works is each page generates its own file. So as a teacher responding to writing, I end up using, they have these post-it notes. And this is a, a set of papers I responded to. So that as I'm responding to student writing, I can write a couple of things, but mainly I can record my voice and I can send that out to them fairly easily. Um, now back to our show. Uh, they don't have to have an Evernote account to play it. If they are using the pen, they do need to have an Evernote account in order to, uh, if it's the Wi-Fi pen. The wired pen works slightly differently, and instead of the Wi-Fi pen exports as an HTML5 file, and the, sorry, and the, Ever, the Wi-Fi pen with the Evernote account exports as an HTML5 file. The wired pen, which you can get for under $100 now, especially if you go with the refurbished ones, I think you can get them for like 80 bucks, that exports as an audio embedded PDF file that uses Flash to play. And then we wait three seconds as everybody holding an iPad goes, damn! If you don't want to sit in the glaring light, you can move the chair over. Um, here's a mic for you at some point. Okay, so Evernote, as I'll talk about more in detail shortly, I've found to be really great for sharing work. Um, all of my students this year had an Evernote account, and there are teachers who make much better use of that than I managed to this year. Um, for text creation, they ended up feeling a little stymied by it. It basically creates RTF files, and they wanted more options to make their work prettier. Um, I did get them to do some successful collaboration work where I created a note that everybody shared and everybody had to update for a, a project-based learning thing we were working on. That worked pretty well, but they never although they had it and I kept pointing them to it, they never picked it up and used it on their own, which is kind of my litmus test for if this is good or not. You know, do I see them using it on their own? We also had a, uh, a, a class set, heck, I had a whole freshman class of LiveScribe pens. It was this amazing pilot program, same thing. Like, I love it as a teacher, totally inspired by it, think it's totally amazing, it fizzled. I'm crazy embarrassed about how bad it fizzled. I gave one to every teacher that worked with the freshmen also. Gave one to each of the freshmen. Had meetings, had trainings. I, I had maybe three adopters and everybody else was just like, meh. Um, so one of the, I should go to the, um, one of the issues ended up being, and I'll try not to repeat myself later on when my notes tell me to say this on a different slide, one of the issues ended up being that it looks like a pen. And pens are easy and they work right all the time. Nobody looks at a pen and thinks, I have to upkeep that. If it looked like a tablet, you'd expect to come to it every day and update it. How many times do you hit that little app thing? Oh yeah, I need to download updates, right? Yeah, same thing with the pen. Every third time you plug it in, it has some sort of update going on. Um, you have to make sure that you keep everything synced up. You have to occasionally reset passwords. You have to sign into the website. All of these things were not in my students' interest, and they ended up taking a ridiculous amount of time away from my instruction because I had to spend a lot of time on the platform, which I just couldn't figure out how to manage. Is that a question? Um, yes, it's, may, it may be on the premium account, but it is. It's a premium thing, and w when you have it on the premium account, it will create a URL for everything in your account. So similar to Google Docs or Dropbox, where you, you know, share a URL, it will create a URL that makes all of that shareable. 
um, and the slide group that I had on the, the way that I shared this uh, slide set was I made a PDF, I attached it to Evernote, and then I shared it via URL. Hmm? Oh, okay, cool. Well, I have to come back over here to look at my notes half the time anyway, but. <laughs> um, so, as I've said most of this before, I, I was really attracted to this because I look at handwriting as being the student's own, like the closest thing to their voice, right? It's the writing that happens naturally at the end of their arm. Um, but I might be wrong about that because that might be typing. Um, I, could, I could be texting, exactly. <laughs> this week's number one comment from my students, why doesn't Google Docs automatically capitalize my eyes? Because it's not your phone? They're like, why isn't it? I'm like, okay, great question. I don't know. Um, communication has the same challenges as regular handwriting. You saw that example, right? So, so you know, if I digitize my own handwriting, it ends up, you know, it's shareable, but it's not ready to share. <laughs> oh, we can't read that. You'll need to do a little more work with that. Um, process is fairly natural as far as creating the text, but as far as getting it ready to share, there's a lot of challenges with readiness, and those go everywhere from do you have your specific pen and notebook and is it charged, to is this created in a way that other people can read it. Um, so a lot of those same issues, and I can't lend a student their LiveScribe pen. And how many pens do I lend out in a year, right? It's like, oh, this will be great. No, no, there's going to be a lot of issues. And that's their pretty slide, but I've shown you an example already. With Evernote, the RTF editing turned the kids off despite its flexibility, despite the fact that you can connect almost anything to an Evernote document. In fact, in an Evernote document, you can like type a little, you can hit voice record, and you can put your voice directly in it, and you can type a little bit more. They were still like, meh. But if you're building sub-plans, it's crazy powerful. Because you can, if you have a premium account where things are shareable, you can write your instructions, you can drop voice directions in there, you can write more instructions, and then you can send that URL to all of the kids, and you can send a note to the sub that says they have the link allow them to use it. Uh, I, I apologize, but I want to make that clear on Evernote. You do not need a premium account to make something shareable. Oh, good. You only need the premium account if you want people to be able to edit your shared notes. So okay, so yeah. if, you want your, if you want to create an editable or a, a, share, a shared note that can be edited, you need a premium account. But... To make it shareable, you don't need a premium account. Thank you so much. What is really, really promising about digital tools and writer's workshop is the fact that things are more shareable than ever. In fact, as tools get developed, what I see happening more often than not is that they're being developed in the direction of becoming more shareable. I was talking to John Samuelson, who if you're on Twitter, you know him as iPad Sammy, and he was describing that icon with the box and the arrow coming out of it. He says, that's the action button. And like, I like that. Um, and that action button is like, how are you going to share this with others? How are you going to share this with the world? Um, so that problem of writer's workshop where that piece of paper only lives with one person and has to physically move from them to the teacher to the audience and back to the writer gets solved by a lot of these shareability uh, innovations. So when I'm looking at tools, the ability to share it between different groups is really important. Um, in, in fact, when I, was, when I finished my slide deck or got it to the point where I was ready to share it, uh, I hit up against this wall of, okay, I want to share this now. And I'm using a uh, PowerPoint as the platform for this. And when I went to share it, it wanted to email it out to people. 
Um, and more and more I step away from email because when I say email, my students go to sleep instantly. It's like magic. Or they'll say, oh, I don't use that account. I'm like, I haven't even said which account yet. Because <laughs> they don't use any of them. It's like, wow, OK, good to know. Um, so we want to find ways to make things available to students that is not email dependent. Because even if they have an account that they check sometimes, they'll have a different one by the end of the year. And they'll never check your account when you want them to check it. They're like, oh, yeah, all my school news comes to that. I don't read that. But that's how we communicate with you. And they're like, no, it isn't. <laughs> Good to know. It's how we want to communicate with you. Thank you for clarifying. Right, if it went as a text. Remind 101, it's amazing. I just haven't figured out how to send out entire papers that way yet. <laughs> the, yeah, attachments, links. That'll be great. Because once it's a link and it's shareable, you can text that to them. That's really great. This is Jen Roberts. She's amazing. Um, she's going to talk about voice comments in just a minute or two. I promise. The, some of the great platforms I've seen for sharing are KidBlog, Evernote, and Google Docs. And as I've, I'm trying not to be redundant as I go through it, so it seems like I don't talk a whole lot about Evernote in this section because I talked about them in the last section. Right? And KidBlog, anybody familiar with KidBlog? Excellent. Um, KidBlog is a blogging platform that's built on top of WordPress. And the people who designed KidBlog specifically set it up to be a blog site for teachers to use with students. Um, I have seen teachers as young as second grade using KidBlog. Um, and I'm sure there's probably some teachers using group blogging even younger than that. What's great about it for teachers is that it is designed to be a completely insular system that as students become more comfortable and more skilled and you're, you're comfortable with sharing it with the wider world, that you can grant greater and greater levels of access and it starts off, you can have it completely moderated, where everything my students do has to be personally approved by me. And as they become more skilled, I give them more permissions. So they start off, and their posts are not posted until I say they're posted. Their comments are not posted to each other until I say they are. No one can read their posts except them. As they get better at writing, we open that up more and more. So uh, this week, or this month, I'm doing a gig in Las Vegas for Dawson College Bound. We've got 100 students grades 6 through 8 who are academically promising but at risk of not going to and completing college. So they're enrolled in a bunch of different classes and one of them is a writing class. I'm running the entire thing on KidBlog. And this week we're just starting commenting. We're in the second week, sixth day. Um, I looked at the, the blog numbers. I have 12,000 page views from the kids. Like every time they go in and edit, that happens. But as a writing teacher, it's pretty gratifying to have like a count of the number of times kids put eyes on what you made. You're like, awesome. And I also get pegged with an email every time they post from home. And I don't give them homework. So when I was talking about using, if a kid picks it up and uses it on their own as a measure of success, right now, they're already just a week and a half into class picking kid blogging up and using it on their own. They come in and they go, what's, what's the address again? How do I get on it from home? No problem. I'll make a handout right now. Here you go. I may have a video ready shortly. Um, because they can share that work with each other. So this week, we're actually watching a video made by Miss Yolis's fourth grade class in California about how to comment. And I told the kids, I go, now, these are fourth graders, but they're really smart, so listen to them. They know what they're talking about. And they listen, and they're like, wow, I didn't know I shouldn't use so many exclamation points. Score. <laughs> uh, so KidBlog is a really great platform for sharing because it can give students access to each other's work. And when they're ready to share with the wider world, I can also give them that access. And at the same time, I just taught them to blog. What a crazy useful skill that is in today's world. And blogging, talk about an audience awareness. I'll talk more about KidBlog later because I kind of go on. But 
Evernote, we talked a little bit about the ability to share how it can create a URL. And then Google Docs. How many people in here have used Google Docs? Very nice. So one of the things there, let's. One of the things that I really like about Google Docs is that students feel comfortable in it to start with. It's a platform that many of them are already familiar with, and the sharing controls on it are pretty finite. You can decide exactly who, with whom you're sharing, or if you want everybody to be able to see it, it's totally my favorite thing to be share anyone with LinkedIn View, because then you, know, you can send it anywhere. And when they updated to allow you to host video in your Google Drive, OMG. I mean, really. Especially considering the fact that the school I'm working at this summer has got one of the most impressive web filters I have ever seen. <laughs> if it's interesting, they cannot get to it. If it's, if it's boring but happens to be made of video, they cannot get to it. So by hosting the videos in my Google Drive and giving them that link, they can view the videos that I make. In order to get them is Miss Yolis here from California? OK, because I owe her an apology, because I totally pirated her video, because I couldn't get to comments for kids where it was hosted. And I ended up making a screencast of the video playing so that they could watch the video. And I hosted that screencast in my Google Drive. Um, KidBlog allows students, it's, for voice, it's really good. There's a lot of uh, editing options. In addition to that, they can attach almost any media they want to a KidBlog post, which means that if you're thinking, gosh, how could I have my kids create a podcast? They could create an MP4 file and upload it to KidBlog. And you, it'll actually create an RSS feed, which is all you need to have a, to have a blog actually hosted on iTunes. So your students, your class could actually have a podcast that gets hosted on iTunes strictly out of this kid blog platform. I didn't know about that until I heard Jeff Herb and Jeff Bradbury talk about it on their show about podcasting for free. It's amazing. Um, communication, blogs are awesome platform to engage an outside audience. The kids really quickly get the hang of the process. I spent the first day and a half teaching them how to log into their kid blog and their Google Drive account and how to get work from one to the other and how to copy your Google Drive work into kid blog. After that, they're off to the races. I come in, I go, OK, here's the warm up. I want you to grab one sentence from that. I want you to open a Google Doc. When you've got that to where you're comfortable, I want you to set it up as a blog post. And not every student knows every step, but they know enough that they, and then they get to a point, they ask the person next to them, they help them out. Um, Audience is authentic and accessible. For example, I've got kids this week writing about how they want to learn more about anthropology. Yeah, next week they're going to send those posts to anthropologists. And some of them will respond from what I've seen. It's really cool. Earlier I talked about immediate affective response. And that's you know giving a student feedback that has emotional impact to it and it carries that emotional energy. The writing that we do does not carry emotional energy. If we write it down, we are totally out of control of tone. And then we give it to a student who's really stressed out that we're not going to like their writing. And then they read what we wrote. And the first thing, wow, I really liked your blank, blank, blank. And they're like, they hate me. <laughs> it's really hard. Because I work in forming a really great relationship with my students. But inside their head, when they're reading my feedback to their writing, I am the meanest person in the world. Uh, so what I'm looking for are tools that allow me to give them that sort of uh, kind of data-rich feedback that contains at least my voice one-to-one -one and allow them to do that with each other. Um, some of the tools that I've done for this screen capture, voice comments for Google Docs, and comments on KidBlog. Screen capture is really great. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about this because I have some really good videos on it. You can watch them. There are links on this presentation, which I think you can still get to on the document I sent you. But also on the web page, there are these links. 
Um, typically what I do for a screen capture is I set it up so I have their work, and then I have me taking physical notes under a document camera, and they have also my voice. Uh, challenges to screen capture include the fact that you need to know how to create video and do something with it, or you need to have equipment that's powerful enough to create video and do something with it. One of the coolest things I've ever seen and been able to work with is the Juno front row system because what it is, it is essentially an amplifier with an infrared microphone, but it's got this screen, screen capture software to it. And their screen capture software is over the top awesome because once you set it up, it automates the whole process. It will auto name the file for you and it will auto embed or auto encode the file and then deliver that to a uh, Dropbox or Google Drive folder that you have designated as shareable. So then you just share that link with the students and they can go and get that exact feedback. Question? Yes, how do you set it up so that you can see the editing maneuver as well as the video of you doing that? Uh, webcam pointed at your face. If, you if you're editing a physical paper, usually I'll scan it in so I've got an electronic copy of the paper that I'm highlighting. If you want to be able to edit a physical paper and have you visible, you can set it up so that you've got uh, a, an open window, so this is your desktop, you've got an open window of your webcam from your computer here, and you've got a document camera window open here that you've, you're writing on. So, you know, it's just essentially leveraging your desktop. Now, one of the neatest tools that I've come across this year is voice comments for Google Docs. How many of you are familiar with voice comments? Just a few. Awesome. Not nearly enough. Um, at this point, I want to give Jen, like, 30 seconds. I, I want to give you, like, the whole time. I know. But you only take, have, like, like, eight minutes. I left. know. Take, okay. take at least three so, of them to so talk about this. So I have a um, uh, voice comments, and this is a little intimidating because the developers in the audience. Um, voice comments is something that came out in Google Docs a couple of months ago that I discovered a couple of months ago, and I found it literally at my lunch break, and I got so excited that I stopped eating my lunch, and I figured out how to use it. And I made a screencast immediately of like, oh my gosh, this is how you do this. So I have it here in a tweet, and I'm tweeting it out to you on the Patu It's the uh, hashtag. So that is a link to my two and a half minute, how long is it, three minute, two and a half minute video on literally steps you right through how you do voice comments for your kids. And what that does is it allows you to open that Google Doc in a slightly different application. You have to add something to your Google Docs. The video shows you how how to do it. And once it's open, you can highlight text as you talk and say, here in this sentence, I think you meant to say. Um, I know there are other exciting, th right now all you can do is sort of add your voice to different parts of it. There's other exciting things coming where you can add tags that may include links to, uh, this is an example of a place where you're mixing your verb tenses. Here's a podcast you can go watch about how to fix that. So really neat levels of detail with that. You have like, oh, you've got that. Okay. So, so, and then when the student gets it back, uh, they get it back with a link like that in their document. When they click that link, it goes to this, which has a play button, and they can play back your voice comment. So this is our workflow test. I don't know about this one, man. You need to get a job and stay there. Only if it's worth staying, right? <laughs> So that's what it looks like on the, you know, sort of to the kids when you play it back for them. So any, uh, it's a fabulous, fabulous tool. It is a little time consuming, but uh, it's very worth it. My kids love it. Yeah, questions? You said you tweeted that link afterwards. I did, and then my tweet failed, so I just tried to send it again. Did you send it in a different way, too? You don't do Twitter or uh, I'm sure Sam has it on his resources, right? You have yes. to my tutorial video. Um, if it's not yeah. there now, it will if, be soon. And if my tweet continues to fail, which I've had a problem with a few times this week. Um, I'll keep sending it out, and, and um, uh, Sam will have it up there. It's also in, I don't know what the exact title is in YouTube. Let me get that for you. I'm Jennifer yeah. Roberts, uh, J. Roberts1 on Twitter, and the actual YouTube title, if you want to search it specifically, is Doc's Voice Comments. So if you search Doc's Voice Comments Roberts, you'll most likely find it. Okay. And if you want, there's instructions on the presenter Wi-Fi right here. Oh, yeah, I could probably use that. That might get my tweet to go out better. Let's see if it worked this time, because I didn't get a message that it failed. So right. very cool stuff. Uh, if you're interested in this and you're like, wow, that's compelling, Max is right here. 
He's one of the developers of voice comments. I was lucky enough to meet him this year. When I started doing tech integration, I thought, you know what, I'm sitting right here in the middle of Silicon Valley. There's got to be a way to meet people who are doing this work. Max is the coolest guy I've met. Um, and he's part of a startup incubator called Imagine K12, which works with really amazing tech folks and connects them with great educators. And it's an incredibly right-minded incubator because the first thing they tell their developers is go talk to teachers. And everybody connected with them, um, I'm trying to remember some of the other ones that have come through there. Um, hmm? Oh, Remind 101 was an Imagine K-12 incubator. Um, there's a bunch of others that I should mention right now, but I'm blanking. Do uh, Class Dojo? Really? Things I didn't know. Class Dojo is one of them. Um, so really amazing stuff has come out of there. Oh, harsh. Right? This, this is the first time we've been in the same room together. Uh, I was tweeting to him from another room that I was next door, and he's like, you should come over and talk about voice comments. You made that awesome tutorial. And I said, okay, fine, I'll come over. We've actually never met. So, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Twitter. I, I, I'm going, wait, we've never met? No. Oh, no, that was just a Google Hangout. Right. It's, it's so surreal. Um, but I love my Twitters. So, kid blog comments, stay connected to the text. The teacher can comment privately. One of the reasons that I've been so successful with my 100 students on KidBlog is that in this summer setup, each of these groups of students has two, each group of 20 students has two group leaders. I've made every one of those group leaders a moderator. So how do we make writing workshop work? We get help. And that help often is not available, but when it is, recruit them and train them. And I actually had to, they, I started off calling them moderators, and there's different levels of access, and I had to promote them all the way to teacher so they could leave a private comment. Because it's important to be able to leave private comments, because when I tell a student that they, the formatting is off and they really need to capitalize their I, that's not really important to anyone but them. I'm trying to make sure they look as good as they can. I, I couch it in digital citizenship. I'm not picking on your writing. I'm making sure you look good in public. Um, so we're able to leave that comment as a private comment. Then I can leave another public comment that says, wow, I really loved learning about your experience raising pet rats. That's really interesting. My wife and I have rescued a couple rats and placed them with adopted, you know, foster homes and blah, 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 share whatever. Yeah, right? It's another story. Uh, another Twitter feed, too. But um, so that level of control and moderation and support is really important. So being able to respond to students one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's using your voice, like with voice comments, or even in text, is really important. Tools for revision. Google Drive and voice comments and kid blog. This is my workflow for this summer. The kids draft everything in Google Drive. Later this week, I'm going to start using voice comments with them, and I'm going to train my moderators to use voice comments too, because uh, they are all we're a Google Apps for Education site, so they all have Google accounts, so they should all be able to give the students voice feedback on the writing, which is so important because you can say things like, "This writing is not nearly as good as the rest of the stuff you've done," with warmth. You write that out, not so much. Um, using these in conjunction is really important because Drive allows them to share just with who they want to share with, and when they're ready to share it with the larger group, they can put it on KidBlog, and they can still revise. They were like, oh, no, I've submitted this for review, but I wanted to add a photo. I'm like, no problem. Go to Review Posts, click Edit, you've got it. So they, they still have access to work even once they've submitted it. Um, final step in Writer's Workshop is publication. So with all of this, you want to make sure that you can show them the work they've done at the end of it in a way that's attractive. Um, so for blanking, OK. The full site kind of grand, beautiful, super publication, uh, the National Writing Project runs a site called Digital Island. 
which is an amazing platform for sharing student work. I will openly admit I have not used it well enough. I, have, I don't have any of my own stuff up there. I don't have my students' stuff up there. Everything I see from them is crazy awesome. So it's a really great site. KidBlog, this summer, we're actually using as not only the writing class but there's a uh, platform, but there's going to be a digital portfolio that the students have created by the end of this uh, Dawson College Bound program. So the work they're doing in any of their classes, they can highlight, share, create as a digital portfolio so that when they go on to other things, they can share their digital portfolio site. By tagging the digital portfolio posts as digital portfolio, they can do a search of their blog for digital portfolio and have a URL that just points to all of those digital portfolio posts. So, and what's great is I've got the music teacher, he's having them record stuff with iPads, and then he uploads it to the media library and KidBlog. They can link that recording to their own blog post and they can write about the learning they've done in music class. When the dance class does a performance, we're going to take a video of that. We're going to make sure it's in the media library on KidBlog. They're going to be able to get to that and associate their blog posts with that. Um, because when we teach students about writing now, we also need to teach them about digital citizenship because the best writing we do is seen by many more people than we could ever anticipate. And in fact, the worst writing we do is also seen by many more people than we could ever anticipate, which is usually where the digital citizenship piece comes in, right? But um, I saw a t-shirt on the travel out here that says, what happens in Vegas stays on Facebook and YouTube forever. <laughs> So that's, you know, kind of where I come from with the kids, you know, talking about by the end of this summer, you're going to have an awesome digital portfolio that's going to be the foundation of your digital tattoo. Because it's not a footprint, because it's not washing away, no matter how high that tide comes in, it's a digital tattoo. It's going to live forever. You want it to look good. Uh, by URL, publication, Evernote, Google Docs, they allow you to create a document and share it. Um, very easily by URL. And I'm two minutes over, I'm sorry. We do want your feedback. Please give session feedback to that address. Uh, you, or rather use the mobile app, use the website, use the conference website. Um, I do want this to be an ongoing conversation. I have a bunch of cards and will gladly welcome any and all talking. I think I'm just going to like put a stack of them right here. And if you want to have a further conversation, I can probably get away with being in this room for about 10 minutes more before they start shuffling me out. Thank you so much for coming. It was amazing sharing with you this